This talk is designed as an introduction to coronaviruses. It's divided into three parts. The first be an introduction to coronaviruses and a brief history of human respiratory coronaviruses. Then uh, talk about the coronavirus life cycle and the many proteins expressed by these viruses. And then innate immune evasion by one coronavirus protein, a story from my own lab. Coronaviruses are members of the, of, the, of the order nidoviruses. Nidoviruses are named for the nested subgenomic mRNAs, messenger RNAs generated during infection. They're envelope viruses of about 100 to 150 nanometers. And they all have single-stranded positive sense RNA genomes, which means that their RNA genomes actually can serve as messenger RNAs. So here are coronaviruses and the other members of this uh, nidovirus superfamily. Coronavirus virion is actually kind of simple. Uh, there's a very long RNA shown here in, in the helical uh, configuration. It's, it's complex with a basic nucleocapsid protein forming a helical capsid. Around the capsid is a membrane that's derived from the host cell membrane. There are uh, three proteins in the membrane, the spike protein, which everyone's heard about, which mediates entry, binding, and fusion. It's a, a major determinant of tropism, of B and T cell responses, and of virulence. Um, the two other glycoproteins in the membrane are the M protein uh, that's shown here, the membrane protein, and the E protein, which is called the small membrane protein. And uh, some coronaviruses also encode a hemagglutinin and esterase protein that's shown here. It's a small spike glycoprotein. Um, SARS-CoV-2 does not encode that virus, that protein. Okay, so before 2002, with the emergence of SARS, coronavirus research focused mostly on murine coronavirus, MHV, a, a model coronavirus. It was isolated in 1949, and it provides a model for hepatitis, encephalitis, and chronic demyelinating disease, and was often used as a model for, uh, for multiple sclerosis. And the other um, major direction of coronavirus research, as, as Ron uh, told you earlier this morning, was uh, the study of animal coronaviruses, important pathogens of pigs, cows, cats, birds, and there was a lot of focus on vaccine development in the early days. Also before 2002, there were many types of diseases caused by coronaviruses, and I think Ron also outlined this. So there are respiratory viruses, uh, the human corona, cold coronaviruses, OC43 and 229E, there's also an avian infectious bronchitis virus and a bovine coronavirus. Um, central nervous system disease can be caused by the neurotropic mouse hepatitis virus, which again is a model for encephalitis and demyelination. Uh, some uh, MHV strains cause hepatitis, uh, which I'll talk about later, just touch on. Uh, there are GI infections, porcine TGV, transmissible gastroenteritis virus, avian virus, bovine virus, MHV, and also feline coronavirus. Um, feline FIPV, which is a variant of feline coronavirus, can cause peritonitis. Um, okay, so I wanna give you a coronavirus timeline starting back from the 60s to 70s, although coronaviruses were actually described as early as the 1930s. So in the 60s and 70s, and, and, and since that time, I just put this line here to show that um, we've been studying the MHV as a model virus, animal viruses, and vaccines, and human cold coronaviruses. Those have been studied really for the last 40 years, 40 to 50 years. Um, the, in the 60s and 70s, I can find references to OC43 and 229E. Those are the two um, cold, common cold viruses, although OC43 can also sometimes infect the lower respiratory tract. And then the next coronavirus, a human coronavirus that was described was SARS, which emerged in about 2002, 2003 in China. Um, but after SARS was discovered or, or emerged, people looked for other coronaviruses. I, I call this the pathogenic human coronavirus uh, era. Um, and HKU1 and NL63 were both discovered. And these viruses are kind of, inter, of intermediate pathogenicity. HKU1 causes pneumonia, and NL63 can cause bronchiolitis and croup. And then things were kind of quiet. There weren't any other viruses described until 2012 when uh, MERS emerged in the Middle East, um, causing another similar severe respiratory disease. And then again, in, as we all know right now, SARS coronavirus 2 emerged at the end of 2019. And just to point out, so all of these viruses cause severe respiratory disease. And as Ron said, SARS coronavirus is the name of the virus. The name of the disease is COVID-19. 
or Coronavirus Disease 2019. And just for a little more history, um, the first international coronavirus meeting met in Würzburg, Germany in 1980. Um, the next meeting that I'm just going to mention here is the one that met in, met in 2003 in Egmond am Zee in the Netherlands. Um, this was organized just after the emergence of SARS, and I believe it was held earlier than it would have been uh, because of the SARS epidemic. And then this year, there was supposed to be the 15th International Coronavirus Meeting that would have met in the same place as the SARS, the meeting that met after the first SARS epidemic, um, and it, this meeting was postponed. It was supposed to be in May of this year. So I want to talk a little bit about SARS coronavirus interspecies transmission and show what happened uh, in each of the three um, the three coronavirus epidemics. So um, SARS had its origins in a bat, as Ron said. It then was transmitted to a civet and then to a human, and um, th it was transmitted to many other humans by human to human close contact, and then it was really spread to many places, but concentrated in Asia. Um, it was over in eight months. There were about 8,000 infections with about 10,000, um, with 10% mortality, but 87% of the infections or the disease were in China and Hong Kong, really didn't touch uh, North America, except for there was some, there were a fair number of cases in Toronto. And um, we really don't know how many times this happened. Did it only happen once? Was this a really rare event? Um, we don't really know. Um, okay, so then the next, uh, a major uh, epidemic was the MERS coronavirus epidemic in 2012. Again, the virus came from a bat, a different type of bat from the SARS virus, um, and it was transmitted to a camel. Um, but it turns out that camels, uh, many, many, cam or there's a very high percentage of camels that, that carry this or have antibodies or have been infected to this virus. So the camels could spread the virus to humans. And then there was human-to-human -human spread, but it was less contagious than SARS, and there was a lot of camel-to-camel -camel spread. And again, most of this virus, uh, most of this infections took place in the Arabian Peninsula, with the exception of an epidemic, a small epidemic that occurred in Korea during the early times of the, of the MERS epidemic. And uh, camels are a reservoir for MERS, so this is a little bit different from the role of the civet, where we think the civet was infected and then transmitted the virus, but I don't think it's fair to say that, this, that civets are massively carrying, um, co carrying coronaviruses or have uh, antibodies to coronaviruses. We don't really know for sure. But the camels, but really a high percent of camels are, have been infected uh, with the virus. So the virus continues to kind of leak into humans, and there are still new cases in 2019. This virus had fewer cases even than SARS, but a higher uh, percent mortality rate. So with this in background, we can look at the new uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, epidemic. So again, we think the bat was the, um, the source of the virus. Um, uh, there's been some suggestion and speculation that, that the intermediate species is the Malayan pangolin, but I don't think this has been at all uh, proven, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, but then it surely transferred to humans, where it became uh, very contagious and spreading very quickly among humans. Uh, initially in Asia, but this time, unfortunately, it really spread all over the world, as we all know. And uh, we, to, on uh, the 25th of March, uh, there were 428, 950 infections, 19,000 deaths, deaths, and uh, as of this was yesterday or the day before, 140,000 infections in the U.S. Uh, with 2,400 uh, deaths. So this is behaving very differently from either SARS or MERS. Um, in that it's so highly contagious and has spread uh, much more rapidly all over the world. Um, SARS was gone in about seven or eight months. We don't know when this one's going to be gone or at least uh, quiet down. Uh, so coronavirus, so cross-species infection is not only only a characteristic of these lethal human viruses. So uh, this is actually some data from a uh, review by Stanley Perlman, the next speaker. Um, so human coronavirus OC43 is very closely related to bovine coronavirus, and uh, these viruses are also quite well, quite closely related to the mouse hepatitis virus. Um, so in, in this diagram, we imagine or we think that um, the cow and human, that it's not clear which direction this went in, but that a, a virus uh, acclimated to, to cows 
and then was uh, able to infect alpacas and wild ruminants, where while in these species it probably adapted to grow in each of these species and then spread among um, other alpaca and wild ruminants. So this uh, cross-species infection is not is is quite common among coronaviruses. There are other examples, many other examples as well. So some of the questions we have is where did SARS-CoV-2 come from? Uh, what lineage of coronavirus is it? What is its parental virus and what's the intermediate species? Um, we don't have the answers to some of this, but um, we do have some information that um, I'll go through now. So uh, human coronaviruses can be either divided into alpha or beta coronaviruses. They're also gamma and delta coronaviruses, but the human coronaviruses are found in these two lineages. And among beta coronaviruses, there are A, B, and C lineages. Just all coronaviruses have this very long uh, open reading frame 1A, 1B, which um, encodes replicase proteins, of which there are 16. And I will go through that in more detail. And then they all have spike E, M, and N protein genes in the same order along the genome. And you can see that for all the lineages here. So there's a replication in the structural proteins. And then these small um, open reading frames with numbers on them, 4A, 4B, 4, 5A, 2A, et cetera, are all usually accessory proteins, non-essential for replication. And they're very different among each lineage of coronavirus. You can see that here. Um, and they often don't have homology among them as well. So, so these are something that makes each lineage unique. So if we, and so 229E and NL63 are alpha coronaviruses, OC43 and HKU1 are these so-called lineage A corona, lineage A beta coronaviruses, of which M, the mouse virus is also in this group. SARS coronavirus is a lineage B beta coronavirus, and MERS is a lineage C a beta coronavirus. So these human viruses really fall into different um, lineages of, of virus. So if we want to compare SARS-CoV-2, oh, I should mention here too that coronaviruses undergo discontinuous transcription, which I will describe as well, leading to a very high recombination rate, which may contribute to some of the new vi newer viruses. They also have an er the error rate for RNA replication, which is always greater than it is for DNA replication, is reduced by a proofreading enzyme um, encoded in NSP14, which I'll also get back to. So if we look at the sequence or the genome um, organization of SARS-CoV-2, we see that it fits right into this, um, into lineage B, which is probably why it's named SARS-CoV-2, because it's very, very similar to SARS-CoV-1 genetically. Um, and two of the regions that people have looked at for similarities, similarities or differences are the spike protein, which makes sense since it's the attachment protein and a major determinant of tropism and virulence, and also the, um, the accessory proteins in the 3 prime M end, which makes it different from some of the other lineages of viruses. And I'll talk about both of these um, a little bit more uh, as we go on. So um, early on, um, people, this is from Dr. Zhang Li Shi's lab. She's one of the major people that studies uh, bat coronaviruses. She compared the new virus to uh, several other bat coronaviruses in that same uh, lineage B beta coronavirus group. And the virus that this is most similar to is a bat virus called RATG13. That's in the blue here. It looks very, very close. You can see there's some differences here in the spike gene. Um, these other bat coronaviruses are also closely related, but they have a lot more differences shown here. And here's SARS coronavirus, SARS-1, as we can call it, and that's pretty closely related as well. But again, there's a big dip um, in, the, in the spike gene. It's, there's some real differences between SARS-1 and SARS-2 in the spike gene. So remember this name, RATG13, R -R a bat virus that um, is most closely related to SARS-CoV-2. And just to look at this um, in a, uh, and it's 96.3% related to, the, to this RATG13. And just looking at a tree here that's based on ORF1B sequences, that's part of the replicase, you can see here that, um, that these, these, these are all the newly isolated, or the isolated viruses from the initial Wuhan um, epidemic are very closely related to this bat virus as compared to SARS, which would be up here, and MERS, which would be here, OC43 here and uh, 229E and NL63. So clearly, um, it's most closely related to SARS than any of the other human um, coronaviruses. 
Um, SARS coronavirus uses ACE2 as a receptor. I think everybody's aware of that now. But NL63 also uses ACE2, and this is a much less virulent virus. So clearly, um, just the receptor utilization is not, a, not the only determinant of the disease. Um, MERS coronavirus uses a completely different receptor called dipeptidyl peptidase 4, um, shown here. And um, I was spike of, of SARS-CoV-2 is 75% identical to SARS-CoV, but longer and differs in four out of five Q residues in the receptor binding domain. And this was the question initially, is it still adapting to humans, which I guess is still a valid question. Um, and there's some data that suggests that the spike protein binds more strongly to ACE2 than that of SARS-CoV-1. So to look a little bit more at the spike protein, um, Here's the, the spike proteins of coronaviruses are divided into two subunits called S1 and S2. Um, the receptor binding domain of, the, of this group of viruses is found here in the, the C-terminal part, the C-terminal half of S1. Um, the S2 contains a transmembrane domain because it is a transmembrane protein, a fusion peptide shown here, which mediates cell to viral fusion, and these two heptide repeats, which are part of the fusion machinery. Um, and so a lot has been, has been made of this S1, S2 boundary. So um, some coronaviruses like the um, lineage A and lineage C viruses encode what we call a, a furin cleavage site at this boundary, which means it can be cleaved by the protease furin. And you can see that uh, right here, the, the ones that with asterisks have this fusion site, have this furin site right here. And most notably, SARS coronavirus does not have a fusion site. But the new SARS-CoV-2, which here was just called 219 novel coronavirus, but this is SARS-CoV-2, does have a furin site. And a lot, of been, a lot has been made about that, about how that may contribute to virulence and that sort of thing. But um, the, and notably, the BAT uh, RATG13 does not have the fusion site. So um, just to look a little bit more at the spike, and um, there's the fusion cleavage site. The RARRR is a really good... Um, target for furin, and this is what the, some of the mouse viruses encode. Um, but if we look here again to compare the bat, the human SARS-CoV-2, and the pangolin sequences, um, it looks like this. So SARS-CoV-2 has, the, again, a receptor binding domain, an S1 and S2 subunit, an S1, S2 furin cleavage site, and there's actually a second cleavage site here called S2, um, and both of these cleavages are required for viral entry. Um, this cleavage site is just upstream of the fusion peptide. And um, you're going to hear a lot more about this from Paul Bates this afternoon, so I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail. But just to say that the pangolin, the sequence of the, pan of the viruses found in pangolins, or not even viruses, but sequences um, seen in pangolins of related sequences, show that the receptor binding domain is very similar to the SARS-CoV-2, which is, I think, the reason why people were very excited about it being the possible intermediate species. But it doesn't have the furin site, the cleavage site um, that, that SARS-CoV-2 does. And, um, and this is the RATG13 protein, which um, is less similar in the receptor binding domain, which is why people thought that maybe the pangolin was, was really the precursor. The pangolin virus is very close to SARS-CoV-2, but it also doesn't have the furin cleavage site. And it's less related all in all to the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So at this point, we really don't know about the pangolin, the, the, whether the pangolin really is the intermediate species, but this virus I don't think is an immediate precursor of this one. I think the fact that um, this has a furin site is a kind of a clue as to help us find um, its parental virus, because there may be a bat virus out there or a pangolin virus with, with um, an S12 furin cleavage site, which might help us identify the actual precursor. So um, we have many remaining questions about, like, what is the bad ancestral virus for SARS-CoV-2, and what is the intermediate species? Was the origin of outbreak in the Wuhan seafood market or elsewhere? We don't really know that for sure. What factors drive spillover to humans? And um, why did this take eight years for MERS or 17 years for SARS to happen after the original SARS, um, SARS epidemic, or did it? Were there other spillovers and other coronavirus released into humans, but maybe weren't that pathogenic and we didn't really notice them, That's um, it's possible. So we don't really have answers to all these questions. And I'm going to move on now um, to the next section on coronavirus replication. 
So this is a picture of the coronavirus replication cycle, and I'm just going to go through it pretty quickly. So virus attaches to its receptor, ACE2. It enters the cell, it fuses with the cell membrane. And again, Paul's going to talk about this in more detail. It releases a um, genome RNA, which is translated into a polymerase. Um, and, and this polymerase will then, um, will then synthesize uh, more genome RNA, as well as subgenomic mRNAs. And I'll, I will go through this in a lot more detail in just a minute. A lot of this occurs on um, double membrane vesicles with, by, a, by a process that nobody completely understands, but that's where replication occurs. The RNAs are translated in pro, into proteins. The glycoproteins assemble on intracellular membrane shown here. Um, the, R, the new RNA assembles with nucleocapsid protein and actually buds into these areas of the of membranes, the intermediate uh, compartment between the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi shown here. So it buds into regions that have been decorated with uh, viral glycoproteins and then is uh, released from the cell through a series of, of uh, smooth wall vesicles and it buds out of the cell. So the cell isn't absolute isn't actually destroyed. The cell virus kind of leaks out of the cell. And I'm going to talk briefly about entry um, in some detail about RNA synthesis and protein expression with some uh, discussion of conserved coronavirus proteins. So just to quickly talk about entry, because um, a lot of this has been sort of talked about, I think, that um, coronaviruses can enter cells either at the cell membrane, shown here, directly in the cell membrane, or through endosomes, shown here. And whether it goes in through um, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane directly, or endosomes, really depends on a combination of viral factors and host cell factors. So just to show you here the, um, the, the spike protein again, so depending on whether it has a, a cleavage site for furin here and the S2 cleavage site here, all viruses have an S2 cleavage site. Um, these, these, uh, these cleavage sites can be cleaved by various um, proteases. And cell, cells express proteases in several places on the cell membrane, intracellularly in these vesicles here, in, in endosomes here. Cathepsin is a low pH activated enzyme and all the way through all these different uh, routes of, of uh, viral assembly and egress, there are various places that they can possibly be, the spikes can be cleaved by protease, even in the extracellular uh, space here, like trypsin. And um, so many coronaviruses can enter the cell by either, uh, by either pathway, but this is somewhat dependent on what proteases are available in the cells. And so when we talk about um, Timpers inhibitors, uh, I've heard that timpers is, is this um, protease here. So a timpers inhibitor would tend to um, inhibit direct plasma membrane entry, whereas chloroquine, which, which prevents the low uh, pH um, in the endosome, would be more likely to um, inhibit an endosomal entry pathway. So um, this is all I'm going to say about entry, and, and listen to Paul Bates' uh, talk later this afternoon, which we'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, yeah, there's Paul. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, coronavirus RNAs now. So this is the coronavirus genome. It's a positive sense RNA, as I said before, which means it's actually translated into protein. It, like other eukaryotic mRNAs, it has a five prime cap and a three prime poly A sequence. It also has what we call a leader sequence of about 100 nucleotides shown here. Next to this yellow is a, is a, a TRS, or a transcriptional regulatory sequence. And that's repeated at all these spots down on the genome. I should say this, is, this particular RNA is from mouse hepatitis virus, but the whole process is really conserved among all the viruses. So <clears throat> these TRSs designate the beginnings of each subgenomic mRNA. And you'll, they're kind of promoter regions, as you'll see in a moment. So um, right after the virus gets into the cell, it's translated into a polymerase, as I said before. That polymerase will get, get a, attach onto the three prime end of the genome and transcribe a uh, negative strand RNA, a negative strand copy of the genome shown here with the leader anti-leader. Um, the next thing that can happen is that the polymerase will hop onto the three prime end of the negative strand RNA producing more plus strand RNA. So this is how the viral genome replicates. At the same time that that's happening, um, the, vir the um, virus, the polymerase will also copy a series of negative sense um, subgenomic mRNAs. 
And this is where things become really interesting because this occurs by a non-continuous uh, transcription process. So the polymerase copies the, uh, the plus strand up until it gets to a TRS. It then, the polymerase with the nascent strand then moves over to the five prime end here where, where it has homology with this TRS and copies the leader sequence. So you would end up with a very small mRNA like this. And at some frequency, it misses the first TRS and does this, um, this jump at the second TRS, generating this whole set of mRNAs. And, and then after this occurs, so we now have all these uh, full length and negative and uh, subgenomic mRNA and negative strand RNAs, which are then copied back into plus strand messenger RNAs. So these are the actual messenger RNAs that encode protein in the blue. Um, so, okay, and so um, the, the, I want to say one more thing about the RNAs, and that's about uh, the RT-QPCR detection of coronavirus RNA. So a lot of people are talking about uh, QPCR, QPCR tests for, for infectivity. So I just wanted to explain one thing about the kinds of primer sets that are being used. So um, this is a gel that I found from a paper of mine from 1983, which it's the northern blot showing the messenger RNAs of mouse hepatitis virus. You can see from the smallest to the largest, there's much more abundant of the smaller RNAs. There's actually a gradient, so the, the, the smaller RNAs are more abundant than the large, than each one larger than it. So when, um, when Q, most of the qPCR primers are either against the uh, ORF1B, the RDRP, or the RNA polymerase that's shown here. So I just wanted to point out that these primers will detect only genome RNA. The, this sequence is not present in any of their messenger RNAs. However, when the other set of primers are usually um, to detect nucleocapsid protein, and that's shown here, so these primers are going to detect all the messenger RNAs as well as the genome RNA. So if the sample that someone is um, examining has only virus particles and not replicating virus in cells, um, you would expect that there would sort of be equal uh, numbers of copies of this sequence and this sequence. However, if you're looking at RNA from infected cells, you're going to see a lot more copies of the end gene um, sequences than you will of the replicase. So in a sense, this kind of primer might be more sensitive if you're actually looking at infected cells rather than um, free, vi free virus particles. So the next step after we have all these mRNAs made is translation of coronavirus proteins. So here again is the genome RNA and the mRNAs. So in general, each messenger RNA is translated from its five prime open reading frame. So that's shown here. Occasionally, two open reading frames are translated from one mRNA, um, the E and the NS5B for in the case of um, mouse hepatitis virus. Um, but the really interesting kind of or unusual translation occurs at the, um, the ORF1A, 1B region. So the replicase actually takes up 20 kilobases of the 30 kilobase uh, mess, uh, total genome RNA. And it's translated into two polyproteins called PP1A and PP1A, 1B. Um, and then it's uh, processed uh, co-translationally by a protease into 16 uh, replicase proteins. And I'm, I will talk about them in a lot more detail. But um, this process actually occurs by a translational frame shifting mechanism. And that's shown here. So as ORF1A is being translated, it comes to this, what we call an RNA pseudonaut, a structure in the genome that causes the ribosomes to stall a bit and then accompanied by a slippery sequence upstream over here, uh, causes translation to go into the, move into the minus one frame. So that when uh, the, the ribosomes are translating through ORF1A, mostly they'll stop here at a stop codon here, but at some smaller percentage of time, the, the frame will shift and, um, yeah, and, and it'll continue translating through the end of ORF1B. So in the case of MHV, the, or, this ORF1B is translated maybe about 5% of the time as the, uh, very, the, the shorter uh, polyprotein 1A. So conserved replicase locus encodes 16 conserved, um, coronavirus replicase encodes 16 conserved non-structural proteins. Um, so I want to go through these various proteins because these, these are conserved among, I would say, among just about all coronaviruses. So they're important as possible targets for therapies that might affect um, all coronaviruses or, or any future coronaviruses. So um, 
uh, this is the, the this uh, NSP5 encodes a 3C-like protease. This is the main protease that that cleaves um, most of the polyprotein here, like from here to the end, and produces all these uh, the rest of the most of these 16 um, proteins. There's a second protease, a papain-like protease, that um, is encoded in NSP3, and that's responsible for these two cleavages here. So we need both of these proteases to process um, the viral uh, proteins from MORF 1A and 1B. The viral polymerase, or the RDRP, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, is encoded in NSP12, shown here. So remember what I said before, that this part of the genome is only translated about 5% as, as often as this one. So um, the polymerase is, is translated or produced at a lower level than these uh, proteases. And that's true for a lot of uh, RNA viruses, for reasons I don't can't really explain. So, um, and of course, the RDRP is the presumed target for, remdes for remdesivir as the polymerase. Um, so again, just to summarize, we have two proteases that process replicase proteins, and in fact, some coronaviruses have two of these, um, so three proteases, and the RDRP that replicates genome RNA and transcribes mRNA in that complicated process that I, I just described. Um, so another set of uh, proteins that, that are encoded in the polymer or the replicase gene are, um, pro uh, are an RNA primase associated with the polymerase, a helicase that unwinds uh, double-stranded RNA, because double-stranded RNA is an intermediate in synthesizing these um, mRNAs and, and genome. And uh, it, has, it also has a nucleotide triphosphate activity that might be uh, important for RNA capping for the mRNA. Um, there's an XON, which is a proofreading enzyme. So as I mentioned before, coronaviruses have a proofreading enzyme to uh, prevent uh, too much error rate, which might lead to complete attenuation of the virus. Um, most RNA viruses don't have proofreading enzymes, but it's believed that because coronavirus genomes are so long that they need something to prevent them from just uh, basically becoming too, too mutated. Um, NSP14 also encodes a guanine N7-methyltransferase. That's um, one of the capping enzymes. And um, NSP15 encodes a really interesting enzyme called endoU. And endoU um, is a kind of an, an interferon antagonist. It prevents the uh, accumulation of double-stranded RNA, which is going to, um, uh, going to induce uh, host antiviral pathways, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. And NSP16 encodes a 2O methyltransferase, again, an mRNA capping enzyme. So all of these enzymes I think of as kind of, uh, and there's also NSP14, that's an activator protein for NSP, um, NSP14 activator encoded in NSP10. So these are all enzymes to promote or to aid in synthesis of viral RNAs to cap them and to protect them from host cell sensors and from interferon response. So there's a really quite a big cascade of proteins that um, are needed for making the RNAs, the mRNAs and, uh, and genome RNA accurately and protecting them from the host cell response. All of these, again, are, are conserved targets um, possibly for drug development. Um, there's even another, set, another couple of proteins, so NSP1, um, is a little bit less, I would say, less conserved among the viruses than uh, the other proteins, and it's, it's been attributed many different um, activities. Uh, host, it triggers host mRNA degradation without degrading viral RNA. It inhibits translation. It has some effects on cell cycle and inhibition of interferon signaling. And you're, and you're going to hear more about this protein later. Um, there's a protein called ADRP or macrodomain, and it, it does poly ADP ribose binding and is, uh, again, protection against the host uh, defenses. There's also a deubiquitinating activity associated with NSP3, NSP3 which again is the, um, encodes one of the viral proteases. So these are additional activities to antagonize or to evade host cell responses. Um, okay, so finally, I just want to show this one illustration of uh, NSP13 as a helicase. This was um, just to show that uh, that this this study showed that this SSYA10001 compound is able to fit in the same conserved groove in uh, the helicase of SARS, MERS, or MHV, and this just shows viral inhibition data. So this same uh, compound was able to inhibit all three 
viruses. So this is just an example of how um, these, these conserved viral proteins may be potential targets for drug therapy. And I hope people are interested in looking at these proteins more carefully. Um, so to summarize this section, there, there are many conserved uh, features of coronaviruses. There are subgenomic mRNAs, the non-continuous RNA synthesis, the ORF1A, 1B frame shifting. Then among the proteins, the proteases, the RDRP and RNA modifying enzymes, and further host antagonist activities, uh, NSP11, macro domain, deubiquitinase. Um, and Henry Lee, who's going to speak uh, later today, is going to talk in more detail about some of the research that, um, that our lab, he and I, have done um, on these, um, on these non-structural proteins. So the, the last sort of section is going to be, I'm going to talk about a story from our own lab, uh, just to illustrate how coronaviruses can uh, antagonize the innate immune response. And we're going to talk about one particular protein. But first, um, just in general, virals, viruses like coronaviruses and other RNA viruses synthesize double-strand RNA in, in replicating their RNA. And this serves as a danger signal to the host that um, has uh, sensors such as MDA5, um, that sense the double-strand RNA and activate antiviral pathways. This is the interferon pathway that most people have heard about that triggers interferon-stimulated genes, genes that um, have various antiviral activities. But in addition, there are two other main pathways, the RNA-L pathway that OAS senses double-stranded RNA, produces 2,5A, a small oligonucleotide that um, that activates that causes dimerization and activation of RNA cell, um, which cleaves RNA into single-stranded RNA into small pieces, resulting in protein synthesis inhibition, um, also antiviral, and uh, increases apoptosis. The other pathway is the PKR pathway. PKR senses double-stranded RNA, uh, phosphorylates itself, then phosphorylates EIF to alpha, leading to the inhibition of initiation of protein synthesis. So viruses encode proteins that, that antagonize all of these pathways. Um, but I'm going to talk about just one here. So um, corona, some coronaviruses, oh, I should say that interferon also upregulates these pathways. And so um, many viruses can inhibit this pathway at various steps. But even if, if this pathway is inhibited, one of, either one of these pathways or both can still be activated. So I'm going to talk about one particular accessory protein encoded by some of the beta coronaviruses that completely shut down this pathway. And in the case of mouse hepatitis virus, um, this, uh, this shutting down this pathway is absolutely required for pathogenesis in the mouse. So these, um, th this, these proteins are 2 prime 5 prime phosphodiesterases that cleave 2,5A, the activator of RNA cell. And they're encoded in um, the lineage A and lineage C coronaviruses. So note, SARS and SARS-2 do not um, encode this protein, but this is just to illustrate the power of these accessory proteins. And this is a toral virus, which is uh, related to coronaviruses. So each one of these viruses encodes uh, a 2 prime 5 prime phosphodiesterase, and interest interestingly, in different parts of the genome. So like I said before, each one of these lineages has a different setup of uh, accessory proteins, but, but in the case of these two, they actually have homology. So I'm going to focus on the MHV protein called NS2. Uh, before doing that, um, I just want to show you that uh, these, this is a, a super family of, of proteins called, or enzymes called 2H phosphoesterases, and they're found in just about every species of, of animal. Here's the um, rat and mouse ACAP7 are two prime, have two prime, two prime, five prime phosphodiesterase activities. And here are all the coronavirus uh, proteins aligned. And interestingly, um, the only other uh, virus that encodes such a protein are rotaviruses, completely unrelated. These proteins are characterized by two catalytic motifs shown here, about 90 amino, amino acids apart. So um, we started with uh, NS2, the MHV protein. Um, shown here. So here are the two catalytic histidines, and we were given at the time um, a wild type and mutant uh, strain of MHV that uh, the mutant strain has an in inactivated NS2. Uh, we call the wild type A59, that's the strain. So the next few slides I'm going to show will show A59 wild type and NS2 mutant inactivated enzyme. So I want to show you the power of one, of one protein. Um, 
So uh, we looked at replication of wild type A59 and mutant A59 in bone marrow derived macrophages. This is all in a mouse system with a mouse virus. And you can see that the wild type virus replicates to 10 to the seventh PFUs is a very high titer of virus, whereas the mutant virus pretty much uh, is prevented from replicating at all above background levels. However, when we uh, do the same kind of replication in uh, macrophages derived from, from RNase-L knockout mice, the mutant virus recovers completely. So replication of virus is completely dependent on the ability of this NS2 protein to um, antagonize RNA-cell. And we can see here, um, if this, these are um, so-called RNA chip assays from a bioanalyzer, um, which is kind of a pseudo gel, we can see 28 and 18S ribosomal RNA, which is perfectly intact in cells infected by wild type virus. But in cells infected by mutant virus, uh, the RNA is degraded due to activation of RNA cell. So we can see the same thing in the mouse in vivo. We, um, in our mouse model, we infect the mice intrahepatically. Virus replicates peaking around day five post-infection. Um, and the, the innate immune response is very, er, very important early in infection to protect the mouse. The CD8 T cell response doesn't come up until later. So if we infect mice with this wild type or mutant virus, this is in wild type mice here, the virus replicates again to very high titer. This is a log scale um, of, of virus in the liver. The liver is the main target of, of replication of this virus when we infect it intrahepatically. Um, and the mutant virus really fails to replicate at all. So the lack of this NS2 protein completely inactivates the virus. If we look in RNA cell knockout mice, we see the virus replication comes back completely. The same thing is true if we look at um, viral antigen staining. If we wild type virus can produce lots of viral antigen in the livers of wild type or RNA cell knockout mice, whereas um, the mutant virus can only produce antigen in the, in the absence of RNA cell. This is really background. And the same is true when we looked in H&E stains for pathology, you can see viral cytopathology um, and inflammation in uh, wild type or mutant infected mice, uh, wild type or mutant mice infected with wild type virus, whereas the mutant virus causes uh, an effect only in RNA cell knockout mice. So just in summary, virus makes double-stranded RNA. It's recognized by OAS, which, which synthesizes 2,5A. Um, if the virus has a 2 prime, 5 prime phosphodiesterase, it stops this process completely. Um, and that's true for coronaviruses, MHB, OC43, and MERS, and toroviruses. RNA cell does not dimerize, and virus replication proceeds with pathogenesis. Now, just to say that we were able to, in the same system, we can substitute NS2 with either MERS NS4B or OC43 NS2 and get the same effects in the background of this um, viral system, uh, mouse system. So just one more comment about non-structural accessory proteins. Um, here's the SARS 3' end of the genome. There are some differences apparent in the SARS-CoV-2 accessory proteins. Um, in open reading frame 3, is, um, it looks like open reading frame 3B may be missing. This is an ion channel protein. ORF6 has some differences in its protein at the 3' end, and this is an interesting protein because it, it interferes with the nuclear translation, translocation of STAT1 um, and would have an effect on inflammation from that. ORF8 is interesting because um, it's, it's two open reading frames in SARS and SARS-CoV-2. It's only one. Um, and originally, um, the original SARS had only one open reading frame, two, and then sort of morphed into two open reading frames by deletion. So people are looking at this open reading frame as a possible, that possible changes that occur as it um, acclimates to humans. Uh, there's also some mention in ORF10, um, but not, it's not very well described. So it's of interest to me to know whether any of these differences are going to um, be important for pathogenesis. Uh, so coronaviruses are adept at antagonizing innate immune responses. Each lineage of virus encodes a unique accessory protein that antagonizes antiviral response. And I didn't show this, but there are often redundancy. So it's really important for these viruses to shut down innate immunity, at least early in infection. Um, Stanley will talk, probably talk about innate immunity later in infection. Um, the lineage B coronaviruses encode 2 prime, 5 prime phosphodiesterases that antagonize RNA cell. 
and for MHV is a really important organ-specific virulence factor. The SARS-CoV-2 accessory protein shows some differences from SARS-CoV, but we don't know whether they'll be significant for pathogenesis. I'm sure people will be looking. And just a couple more slides. Um, there are many ways to look at these viruses. So initially, we, we start uh, studying them um, in vitro in human lung-derived cell lines. We're hoping to get primary lung cells uh, from some collaborators here, um, here at Penn. Um, we were hoping to develop an ACE2 transgenic mice. There's been a lot of uh, talk about that among the faculty at Penn. Other people have done that, and other people will do that. Um, they're also already in um, preprint form in bioarchives, reports about ferret and non-human primate models. And I'm going to just go back to something that, that uh, Dr. Coleman talked about earlier, and that's the bat. We have a collaborator um, in Colorado who has a, a bat colony, um, and we're um, experimentally infecting bats with him. And I think, it's, again, as, as Ron said, it's really important to understand the difference between um, host virus interactions in the bat and in the human, because the disease that cause, causes lethal uh, disease in humans causes really, as far as we know, doesn't really make the bats very sick. We want to understand how their immune response uh, may protect them against, against the disease. And finally, just to show some data, we infected bats, three bats, and by day 21 post-infection, uh, Tony Shounce, that's my collaborator in Colorado, found a really good um, immune response uh, against the nucleocapsid protein shown here. It's a very high uh, titer of Biolyza. Um, so I'm going to stop here and just show a picture of my lab. And I want to acknowledge um, particularly Henry, who's leading the effort in the BSL-3, along with Courtney, uh, David, and Hanako that are working during this, uh, this uh, pandemic. So um, I also want to acknowledge uh, my collaborator, Bob Silverman, on the, the last part of the talk that, um, that I talked about. And I will uh, stop here. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. So I've been following the questions as they come up and trying to aggregate um, the, the ones that seem to keep coming up or get the most likes. So let me ask you um, several questions centered on mutations rates in SARS-CoV-2. Um, are the, might the proofreading protein be a target? Can you, what if you mutate that protein? Does the virus mutate itself to death or evolve faster? What about, what about um, mutations? issue of mutation rates. Okay, so um, so so I, I just on a practical level, I don't think that people that have sequenced many, many gene, genomes right now of, of SARS-CoV-2, I don't think there, it's becoming apparent that there's a particular pattern of mutation or particular hotspots that things are changing. So we have to keep watching that. That'll be really interesting. Um, like, that, like I said about SARS-1, that uh, there were changes in, in that 8A uh, became 8A, AB, but we don't really know what that means. So, so mutations don't only, only, they're very hard to figure out what they mean sometimes. Um, as far as the proofreading enzyme, so like I, I said earlier, it's, it's believed that, that this virus needs a proofreading enzyme because it's so long. All of RNA viruses um, mutate at some rate, and, and that's good. It allows them to adapt and evolve. But if they adapt and evolve, if they do that too much, they, they do become highly attenuated. And if you mutate, uh, this NSP14, the virus doesn't do very well. It does become attenuated. It's, it's, uh, it really needs that um, protein to survive. Great. Thank you very much. Um, what about human genetics? Are there known human genetic polymorphisms that put you more at risk for coronavirus infection? I don't think we know that yet. And I think that, um, as uh, Ron said earlier today, that People are going to be, at least at Penn, are going to be looking at uh, genetics to, to see if we can associate any polymorphisms with infection. But I, I would say at this point, we really don't know that. And I don't know that every, anyone really looked at that for SARS or MERS, so we don't know, or other coronaviruses. Well, I do know, I do know, I can say this, this is a little bit different maybe, but like, for example, for the mouse virus, there are mouse strains that um, have, have polymorphisms or, or different, um, yeah, different, I would say different alleles of receptor protein that are more or less uh, infectable. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, Bob Vonderheide asked, why did SARS-1 go away? 
Okay, this is my. I think this. I think the reason SARS one went away that it was it was um, it would kill people more. It made people well. Two things. It killed people more. It also made people sick. They looked apparently sick before they were shedding virus. That seems to be the big difference. So if somebody had SARS one, it was obvious, and they would be in the hospital and they would be treated. Um, whereas now we have people walking around on the streets that may be shedding virus and spreading it before we even know they're sick. So, so there's nothing. If you look at the viral genomes themselves. There's nothing that would predict that um, that the different behavior of the viruses. Great, thank you. Um, one um, question, one person wanted to know, how does furin cleavage contribute to virulence? Um, I don't know that it can, can it, I, well, it's sort of complicated, but, and Paul will talk about more this afternoon, but. But if a virus um, has a cleavage, a, fusion, a furin cleavage site, it can be that spike protein can be cleaved as it's being processed in the, as the new virus is being made, so that um, when it comes when it's extracellular, it already has it's already primed for fusion because it already has that first cleavage, uh, that first cleavage site. So in a sense, you it might um, be sort of more ready to infect cells. On the other hand. Um, there are extracellular proteases and um, membrane-bound proteases that can also cleave, that can cleave in the absence of the furin site. So um, it really depends, again, on the cell type. So it's really hard to make a blanket statement that, that if, if a virus has a furin cleavage site, it's going to be more infectious or more pathogenic or more anything. It really has to, it really depends on um, the cell type, the organ type, the proteases, the cleavage site. Um, could it have an it could have an alternative to furin? It could have another uh, protease cleavage site also in in S1, S2. So it's you really can't make a blanket statement about that. But it is it is an interesting to me. It's interesting that this virus has it because none of the sort of hypothetical precursor viruses that have been suggested do have that site. Great, thanks. Um, a couple of other listeners were interested in the question of what are the main cell types that become infected? What do we know about that? Well, that's not my, this new virus, um, well, I think we're just figuring that out, but certainly uh, type pneumos, pneumocytes in the lung, and I think um, probably Dr. Perlman will uh, address that. And we're really looking at whether other, whether other organs get infected. There, there's literature suggesting that some people might get brain infections or kidney infections, but um, I think that's all just sort of coming out now. Okay, um, maybe one last question before we go to Dr. Perlman. Um, someone asked, um, you're making RNAs on both strands that are complementary to each other. Why don't they bind and just do antisense inhibition? Why does the system uh, all work? Well, don't forget when when proteins are when bi when RNA is being transcribed, it's not really naked. It's got protein around it. So um, there certainly are double-stranded regions, and that's the, that's where the source of the double-strand RNA that alerts the cell um, to to respond with those antiviral pathways. So the virus wants to to minimize the double-stranded RNA. Um, there is going to be double-stranded RNA. It doesn't seem to to silent itself because uh, there's a there's also that helicase that protein that's unwinding it at the same time as well. So there's pro there probably is double-stranded RNA. Maybe there's some silencing. Who knows? There's also, oh, the other thing that's important here, there's about probably a hundredfold more of the plus strand, the, the, the translated strand, than there is of the minus strand. So if you, so maybe you do silence 1% of your, your genome or messenger RNA, but certainly there's a lot more of the plus strand RNA. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Susan Weiss for a really interesting lecture. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that's uh, virtual clapping. Not something we're all used to.